Okay, hello. Welcome to another episode of the Stand, Fight, Win live stream. Real lawyers, real answers. I'm Keith Davidson. And I'm Stuart Albertson. And we are coming to you today to talk to you about trust busting. So we have a series of questions about how do you get assets out of a trust? So just because you're a beneficiary of a trust doesn't necessarily mean uh, that you're going to get paid anything like right now immediately and there's a lot of issues that come around with that but before we get uh, into the questions I do want to uh, go to breaking news and just talk about a case and so um, Stuart this will be the easy side of this issue All right. so this is a case of Pratt versus Ferguson the uh, site is 3 Calap 5th 102 that's 3 Calap 5th 102 there's a case from 2016 and basically what we're dealing with in this case is the grandparents created a trust that had a spendthrift provision and something that the court was calling a shutdown clause, which means if any creditors of the beneficiary come knocking, the trust shuts down and no distributions are made. Well, the, di the beneficiary wanted to use that shutdown clause to keep from having to pay child support. So there's a child support payment. There also was a order to hand over some property that was community property as part of a divorce because the beneficiary was going through a divorce. And so uh, the trial court actually granted the petition saying that the child support could not be collected against this uh, trust assets because the beneficiary couldn't get to them because of the shutdown provision. And it went up on an appeal. And the appellate court, what do you think the appellate court did? I think they reversed. Yeah, of course because it's against public policy. And so there's actually a probate code section on this, section 15305 of the probate code. And it talks about how you can't use spendthrift provisions or shutdown provisions or any of these normal provisions that you would use to keep creditors at bay, creditors of the beneficiary at bay. You can't use any of those um, to keep somebody from getting child support because there's a public policy against that. And so the public policy is we want to make sure children are taken care of. And if there's assets that could be used for that purpose, we don't want a trust provision blocking that. Now, if the creditor coming after the beneficiary wasn't child support, if it was just credit card company, yeah, credit card company that sort of thing you can easily shut down, but not child support. So the reason why I wanted to just touch on that case, which you know we don't need to spend a whole lot of time on it because it's fairly straightforward, but I wanted to point out that there's some areas of the law where busting a trust open and getting the assets out are quite easy just because of public policy. So things like spousal support, child support, these are things that uh, are going to be a little bit easier, especially because there's specific probate code sections on them. And so that's, that's kind of the purpose of that case. But that's not typically where we spend a lot of our time. So most of our time is spent with the more difficult questions and issues where there isn't necessarily a clear-cut answer the way there is with child support. Would you agree with that? I agree. Yeah. So why don't we get into our asked and answered segment and take a few questions and kind of see how this stuff works. Keith, backing up a little bit on that, can you tell us really quickly what a spendthrift provision is? Yeah, so a spendthrift provision is a provision in a trust that essentially stops a beneficiary from being able to assign their interest to somebody else. It also tells the trustee that if a creditor comes knocking on the trust, uh, on, at the trustee's door asking to be paid, the trustee has a right to shut down the trust and not make any distributions out. Would you I agree? To yep, 100%. So yeah. that's what that is. Thank you. Okay, our first question today is, the trust requires my inheritance to be held in the trust for my lifetime. Is there a way to force the trustee to give me a lump sum? Great question. A lot of people want to get paid today. What are, what are your thoughts on that one, Stuart? Uh, I think forced is a strong word uh, to add here. Can you force the trustee? Um, Probably not. I mean, maybe you could force the trustee if the trustee's done a bunch of breaches of trust and they're facing a law of liability. You might be willing to let them off the hook if they give you a distribution and you get court approval on that and everybody's happy. But I think the real question is, is you know, you have a right to income 
maybe some principal from the trust, but it's at the trustee's discretion, which that's never comfortable having to approach somebody for distributions. And the question is, can I make them or can I get them to distribute my stuff now? And, and the answer is maybe, maybe. And so I think the conversation has to be had with the trustee, the trustee's attorney, if they have one, to explore those options to see if there is a way, uh, there could be changed circumstances that you would present to the trustee saying, look, this makes sense to do a distribution now. Uh, you know, keeping this in trust for a lifetime, my client is 60 years old and, you know, it's an engineer and already has lots of money and, and has a home and they're not somebody that's going to go out and make bad decisions with this extra money. Uh, why don't we see if we can get an agreement here? And in many cases, you'll get a trustee who will say, hey, if the court doesn't oppose it, I won't oppose it. So make your petition to the court and see if it's something that can be worked out. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a right to a lifetime gift and a lifetime income stream from the trust and some principal on top of that, and you tick the trustee off, uh, now you may not be able to get an agreement. So right. this is where you want to be nice to begin with and see what happens. It is interesting how sometimes we'll contact the other side and the trustee may be open and willing to make a distribution because they don't honestly want to manage this stuff anyway. And so they're more than happy to, to get out from under that responsibility. And then other times, like you said, they, they fight like tooth and nail. So you can't, I would agree, there's no way to force it per se, but there are ways to kind of position the case where you might be able to get a distribution of some or all of your trust up front. So I have a question about that. Um, if the relationship between the beneficiary and the trustee is amicable, do you still have to go through the court and file a petition, or is it something that can be worked out between the two individuals? Well, we're always willing to let a trustee make a distribution to us, absent a court order, right. but most trustees are going to require a court order of some form so that they can protect the liability. And the reason for that is, is in many of these cases, there's what we call remaindermen. Uh, there's people that would inherit if you pass away. Uh, or after you, you know, after you're done consuming what you consume during your lifetime, there's some remaindermen. So generally, you're going to want to notify them of the plan to make a distribution, and they may show up and object. If they show up and object, you can generally uh, come to some some type of an arrangement with them to have the thing still go through. Mm -hmm. But it, it complicates the matter. So trustees, in general, are going to want a court order so that they are not uh, messing up to anybody else that may potentially be a beneficiary down the road. Yeah. Okay, our next question is, the trust is supposed to be used for my support, but I am not receiving enough support for my basic living needs. What can I do? So, you go ahead. So this is a question where we, we do have people come, from us, come to us from time to time, and they say, hey, I've got a trust, it's got $3 million in it, and I'm getting $400 a month. And you're, as a lawyer, going, well, that doesn't seem reasonable, so what, what right. can happen there? Well, first you have to look at the trust terms and see what are the distribution requirements. And most trusts will say, you know, either income or principal or both can be distributed for health, education, maintenance, and support. So then the question becomes, okay, well, you're entitled to support from the trust. You're getting 400 a month. What do you need for your support? And then you make up a list. Well, my rent's 3000 a month and my car payment's 500 a month and this and that. And you start to assemble a list of this is my support, and then you submit it to the trustee, and you say, okay, here's what I need my, for my support. And the trustee at that point kind of has two choices. They can either say, yes, I see that you need that, and I will provide that to you, which is what a good trustee would do. Or the trustee might say, no, $400 is enough. I'm in charge. I can do whatever I want. And that's when you have to go to court on a petition for instructions, and you have to ask the judge to order the trustee to make a bigger distribution to you, which you, you can do and most judges will support that if you can justify why you need more money for your support. But unfortunately going to court costs money. There's no way to force the trustee to give you what you deserve outside of going to court. It just, you know, there's no governmental agency out there who's going to step in and, and find the trustee or something if they don't do the right thing. So it's incumbent upon the beneficiary to make that right. But there's definitely an avenue you can take, which is you go to court, get a court order. You touched on this a little bit in your previous answer, but what is the HEMS standard? So we use HEMS, uh, in, you know, just internally to, to refer to 
a distribution standard that's based on health, education, maintenance, and support. That's the most common distribution standard that you see because it's what we call an ascertainable standard. And so what that means is the, that standard can be enforced. A uh, trustee can be forced to make distributions under that standard that are reasonable if they're not doing it already. And it's just kind of a, a very commonly used standard. Health, education, maintenance, and support, those are the things the trustee should be looking at in determining how much the beneficiary should get. I have a question about that. Is there a calculation uh, to this standard? No, there isn't. I mean, it's, it, it, it's just facts. It's just reasonable facts based on the situation. So there's no preset calculation for that. It just comes to what are the facts, what are the support, how much money is in the trust, a lot of varying factors for that. Would you agree with that, Stuart? Or? I agree. Yeah. Okay, the next question is, how do I know if I'm supposed to receive my share of the trust now versus being held in trust longer? So a lot of times you'll pick up a trust document, it's going to be 40 pages long, let's say, and it can be really confusing to understand the terms of the trust. And so there are some terms that we tend to try to look for to figure out if something's supposed to be distributed now versus later. And what are, what are some of the things that you're keying in on when you're looking for that story? Well, they'll say something along the lines of, I, get, I hereby give the residue and remainder in three equal shares to my three children. Well, that's what we call a blow-through trust. And that means as soon as the trust administration is done under a reasonable amount of time, those distributions need to be made. If there are terms stated for those distributions, for instance, you have a child who's 20 years old when, you, when the parents pass away, there may be mile markers at age 25, 30, 35, and 40 to distribute the entire trust. So they'll distribute 25% at 25, another 25% at 30, and so forth. But you'll look to the trust terms. Uh, it can get quite complicated because not only do you're looking to the trust terms to see if there's a period of time that the uh, assets will be held in trust for the beneficiary, but then sometimes you have different trusts being funded with different amounts, and those beneficiaries of each of those sub-trusts may be different beneficiaries. They may be the same, but it's not easy to track all that through. Yeah, it can be. The one thing I do look for, though, if, you, if you're supposed to get your assets now, there should be some terminology of that. It should be either it should be distributed you know, currently, or the most common word is outright. So typically, you know, these assets will be distributed outright. That is um, lawyer language, I guess, for give it now versus later. So to the extent that that helps, but every trust is so different and they, they can say different things and it, it is, uh, you know, your, your trust could vary. What happens if the trustee and the beneficiaries disagree on the level of support needed? And I think we touched on that one. I mean, basically you go to court and you, you ask for a court order. Think there's anything else for that one? Too? Well, I mean, and that's that's part of the problem here is is that this this relationship normally doesn't go that well because trustees tend to be very paternalistic and they right. have a different view of what reasonable is than the beneficiary. Right. Uh, and I don't think that either person's wrong, but the trustees looking at this from a standpoint of I want to protect, maintain, grow. Uh, the beneficiary is looking at I want money now, and so. Uh, when those conflicts happen, sometimes you're going to have to go in and ask the court for instructions on how to move forward on distributions, um, and, and that can happen from time to time. So, just uh, kind of appending to that, how would a trustee know that they're stepping over the line of uh, being a good trustee to being potentially a jerk? Uh, is there a <laughs> way they can police themselves and avoid problems with beneficiaries? I think that a, a good trustee should always include a beneficiary in the decisions uh, about uh, distributions. And so let's say uh, there is a HEM standard, which is a, a restrictive standard, but it, there's, there's room in there to figure out how to support a beneficiary. And so what I would do if I was a trustee, I would say, hey, beneficiary, why don't you send me your budget? Send me your line items in your budget. Tell me what you want for each line item and let me review it. And then I'm gonna call you and we're gonna talk about it. We're gonna go over it. And then ultimately, I as the trustee have to make a decision. I've got that power under the trust, uh, but I'm gonna do everything in my power if I'm a trustee to meet what that beneficiary is asking for. And if I think they're asking for too much and I don't wanna carry the liability of that, I'll tell them, I won't agree to do this much, but I will petition the court and ask the court if they'll allow me to do this. And if they will, fantastic, I'm happy to do it. And what that does is, 
it diffuses any animosity that the beneficiary may have towards me. And the animosity is just natural. It just happens yeah. in these cases. Beneficiaries mm -hmm. tend not to like trustees, and trustees tend to think that beneficiaries are uh, kicking them in the teeth. They work hard to keep the trust up in their mind, and the beneficiary right. just comes around asking for money all the time. Well, I love the fact that two things that you said are, are absolutely crucial. One is find out from the beneficiary what they need. So many trustees just decide, I'm giving you 500 bucks a month, and yet, if it's a $5 million trust and somebody needs 5000 a month, yes, of course you can distribute 5000 a month. What's the problem? Why are you making an issue of that? But that's what some trustees do. The other, So talk to your beneficiary. That's, that's number one. Document what they want. Document what your decision would be. So I'm either going to grant this or deny it. And if I am going to deny it, this is why I'm going to deny it. And if you can articulate it reasonably, then, then fine. Secondly, so many trustees miss the point that you, the trustee can go to court and ask for court permission too. And so, you know, the idea that the trustee can petition for instructions from the court, that's absolutely brilliant because it does two things. Number one, it gives the trustee security that any distribution the court order orders is not going to be something that the trustee can be sued on later because once you get the court order you can't be sued on it later and it makes the court the bad person and it makes the court the bad person exactly and then the trustee can say gosh you know i would have loved to have given you 50 grand a month but that darn judge you know he, he said 45 grand a month yeah right and some people can live on that some people can't but yeah it makes his court the bad guy and that's i think as a trustee that's really what you want to do is you want to make yourself look beyond reproach and, and that's a good tool to do that. I'd take 45 grand a month. <laughs> <laughs> you can live on that. For anyone out there that wants to make Kayla a beneficiary of that's their trust. That's right. It will only cost you 45 grand a month, not a penny more. <laughs> okay, our next question is, the trust states that I am to get one third of my trust share at ages 30, 35, and 40. I do not trust the trustee to manage my money until I reach age 40. What legal action can I take? So this is a, a good question, Keith, and we do run against run up against this quite often. And it's, it's this is the stepping stones or the milestones I was talking about earlier, where distributions can be made. The problem is this is a right here. This is a ten year period, and the question is is who's managing the trust property during that time? And what if I think they're a buffoon? <laughs> well, first the starting point is let's look at the trust document. Does the trust document give you any rights to remove and replace a trustee? Because some of them do. It's a small percentage of them, maybe 20% of trusts out there will give you that power. Uh, so that's the first point. So you might just have that power and you can just boom, exercise it and off you go. Secondly, if that's not going to work, I would again talk to the trustee and see if you can come up with an investment plan that you can live with and the trustee is willing to implement and make sure you check up on that plan. You know, that's that'd be a great way to do it. And as a trustee, I think a trustee should welcome that because if I, as a trustee, if I can put together an investment plan that you're happy with as a beneficiary, it's fantastic. I'll even get you to consent to it because that's one of the ways to get out of liability as a trustee is get the beneficiary's consent. If that all fails, then you have to go for removal. But that is that can be tough because. You, you're not necessarily going to convince a judge to remove a trustee just because you don't like how they're investing. And so it's almost, you're almost in a position where they have to invest poorly, they have to lose money, and then that'll give you your grounds to remove them. It's very hard, I think, to get removal before there's damage. Well, and let me say, we had a case years ago uh, when we first uh, started practicing together where the trustees had 3 or $4 million that they put in a non-interest-bearing bank account. And they left it there for year after year after year. Well, that was our Achilles heel, and we still had a tough time getting yeah. those trustees out. Uh, they weren't managing the, the property uh, at all, and we still had difficulty. Now, I will point out these IPSs, these investor policy statements yes. that you mentioned are crucial to trustees. I think if more trustees would get the beneficiary's input into an investor policy statement, an investor policy statement simply states what type of investments are appropriate, what's the time horizon for these investments, uh, when should they be, uh, how much should be in bonds, how much should be in stocks. And these are things that you should include the beneficiaries on, whether they consent to or not. Because if you have an investor policy statement as a trustee, it's showing that you put forethought into how these assets would be managed. You included the beneficiary. Boy. How many trustees have done that lately for us? Not many. Not many. And then the beneficiary has a say. Hopefully they consent. Fantastic if they do. If they don't, I still think 
a trustee with an investor policy statement is in a much better position if the market tanks yes. and things go south because hindsight's not going to be used against them. Right. It's what process and procedure did they have in place when they started investing those assets. If it was simply, well, it was what the decedent had previously, that's not good enough. Right. If it was, I'm going to put them in a bank account, even at interest of 0.02%, that's not good enough. No. There has to be some thought put in, how are we going to invest these assets? And if it's all real property, is it okay just to leave all those assets in real property? No, that's not diversified. You gotta have a diversified account. Yeah, that alone is, is a breach of trust. But yeah, trying to get to convince the court of that is very difficult. Now the investor policy statement, that's a written document that shows what your plan is for investing. And every single reputable brokerage firm out there has them. They already have them. They're pre-printed. You adjust them, you, you tweak them based on your scenario. But the, the documents are already out there. Everybody knows what these are in the financial industry. And yet trustees don't use them. So rare. I mean, corporate trustees do, but not uh, not individuals. It's crazy. Well, and you know, these beneficiaries have a right to be concerned about how trustees manage money because most sure. of them don't do a very good job. We had one trustee that put what hundreds of thousands of dollars into a private placement, yeah, which is only suitable for multimillionaires, and lost it all, and lost it all. Yes, yes. It wasn't even a good gamble. It was a bad but, gamble. But they still own the paper. <laughs> and he kept saying that. I mean, he's, on the, he's on the stand at trial saying, but we still own the interest in the, in the entity. Yeah, yes, but how right. much is the entity worth? Yeah. It's worth zero. I'll sell you an empty milk bottle. Yeah. You still own a milk bottle. Yeah. Well, I was going to say that it seems like more of the problems arise with trustees who are relatives or lay persons um, due to the there being some amount of financial intelligence that needs to be uh, used. But um, is that the case? Are there going to be more? Do you experience more issues with uh, professional um, trustees, corporate trustees, or with um, with uh, relatives and, and laypersons? Yeah, I think numerically, uh, I think it's laypersons who are acting as trustee who tend to violate these duties the most, just because they don't have the training. They don't have the knowledge. They haven't been doing this for a living. You know, a corporate trustee, they don't want to be sued. And that's their number one concern. And so they're far more apt to use written investor policy statements. Uh, and professional trustees, too, to some extent. That doesn't mean that professionals can't make mistakes. But I think the lay trustee definitely makes the mistakes numerically more often. I agree with that. Um, every once in a while, though, we do run across... Uh, I remember one time we went against a very large investment company that was managing trusts, and for whatever reason, they, they knew how to manage m individuals' money, but they didn't understand these fiduciary obligations that are put on trustees, Right. and they managed the, the money inappropriately. So uh, it can happen, uh, but uh, yeah, generally speaking, people that are lay people are the ones that are making these mistakes. Yeah. Okay, the next question is, the trust says the trustee can withhold distributions if I'm being irresponsible with my money. What does that mean? So there's times when we see these, I'd call it a cutback provision, I guess, where the beneficiary is supposed to get the money, but you'll have this provision where the trustee has the discretion to withhold the distribution if the beneficiary is in bankruptcy, going through divorce. And then they get into this language of things like, or is irresponsible with their money. And so what power does a trustee have to actually hold on to a distribution in that event, do you think? You know, those are hard clauses to work with. And the reason for it is, is that they're likely enforceable if you can know what they mean. Um, it reminds me of the Supreme Court case when they were talking about photographs of uh, naked women and the, they were trying to define pornography and the Supreme Court wrestled with this and finally one of the justices said you can't define pornography but you know it when you see it right uh, and I think some of that's true here if you know this is not just some trustee that's wielding their power over a beneficiary and being ornery and difficult to deal with this is a trustee that's seen a beneficiary do something they're using drugs they're uh, they're a spendthrift they're going to spending all their money they're not going to school they're not making something of themselves you, you see that and you tend to think that a judge is probably going to agree that maybe you can withhold some distributions because that's not what the parents wanted. But you also see where trustees are just on read beneficiaries and, right. I don't, and, and when you see that you know it too, chances are that's not going to be upheld. Yeah, because it could be perfectly reasonable that somebody doesn't get a college degree or somebody doesn't pursue, you know, maybe somebody wants to become an artist 
Well, you know, that's reasonable for one person and it's completely irresponsible to somebody else. And it's kind of like beauty's in the eye of the beholder. It's, you know, you, there's no accounting for that and it's very difficult. And so these trust terms that try to quantify irresponsibility, they're, they're difficult to enforce, they're nebulous, and most of the time you're going to probably get around them just because you, the court struggles to make any sense of it whatsoever. But things like, uh, you know, if you're in bankruptcy or you're going through a divorce, that's easy. That's, there's some legal process that's been filed. We, we know the demarcation points. So that's a little bit easier to uh, enforce. Yeah, and I, just as you're saying that, I think what the courts are going to look to is, does this protect the beneficiary? And keep in mind, the beneficiary may not always want to be protected. Right. I'm just saying, rarely, does yeah. this protect the beneficiary from themselves or from someone else? Right. And if you can point to you protecting the beneficiary, I think the court's going to go along with it. Right, especially if it's a plan. Like if the plan, you know, the plan is we're going to hold the distribution for a limited amount of time based on these factors and then we'll make the, I mean, it, it, that'd be different from a trustee. Like let's say you just withhold something from a trustee. Well, I'm going to withhold it indefinitely because I don't like the way that you went and bought a new car. Right. You know, that'd be a, a different scenario where I don't think the court would be as willing to support that versus I'm going to hold this until you're done with rehab right? and then I'm going to hand it out to you. I think the court would be more likely to do that. Yep. Speaking of rehab, our next question is, the trustee is trying to make me submit to a drug test before receiving distributions. Do I have to comply? And, and we've seen this a couple of times in our careers, Keith, yeah. and, and this is a tough one too. What's your take on it? Well, first of all, I'd say, what does the trust term say? So if a beneficiary, if the trust says a beneficiary is to receive the distribution outright, and that's the end of it, it doesn't say anything else, drug trust drug tests are not required, they're not even allowed, I would say, and I don't see what, what relevance it has because the trust terms don't call for it. But there are a few trusts, every now and again you'll see a trust where it says that the beneficiary does have to clear a drug test to get their distribution. Okay, well if that's the case, then you do have to submit to a drug test, and you do have to comply with those trust terms. So it really just depends on what's in the trust document. What does it require of a beneficiary? What if the what if the trust term said if the beneficiary is found to be using drugs, they're cut off for 12 months? Does that mean, okay, let's say that they're caught smoking marijuana and uh, the trustee says, ah, there you go, I'm cutting you off for 12 months. Do they then have to submit to drug testing or do they just have to keep from being caught using drugs for 12 <laughs> months to get the distribution started again? And I think it's all going to go back to what does the trust say? So I'd have to read the trust terms and see specifically what does the trust require? What power does it give the trustee to withhold distributions and for how long? And, and then you'd have to go from there. And if there's ambiguity, which there usually is because, you know, there's something somebody didn't think about like that. Uh, then you do the best you can to interpret it, and if you can't agree with the trustee, then you go to court and you get a petition for instructions. But it gets messy. It's it's really hard to enforce, you know, these provisions just because, yeah, it, it's it's messy. Next question is: How long should it take before I receive my share of the trust? So let's assume that somebody's, let's start with the easier one. Let's assume somebody's just gonna, supposed to get an outright distribution. So, you know, the, the parent dies in February, it's an outright distribution. It's getting to be into the fall, September, October, and not a dime has been distributed to the trust. Is that a reasonable amount of time to wait? What, what, are, we, what are we dealing with? It could be. I think you and I are a little different on this. I think you've said in the past that six months is probably where you should be. I think it's more like a year, but what I would suggest to a trustee is once you get your hands around this trust and understand what the assets are, what the liabilities are, and what the likely distribution is going to be, make a preliminary distribution. It's not everything, but make a su substantial preliminary distribution to the beneficiaries. Keep them happy. Let them know you're going to complete the trust administration. But in answer to this person's question on the hypothetical, you gave a blow through trust where simply you're going to get your distribution after administration, I would say six months to a year and a half year and a half, you're getting long in the tooth. That, yeah. That's getting too long out there. There needs to be an explanation why it's taking a year and a half. If there's some unique art and that makes the, the bulk of the value of the trust and that needs to be sold, okay, that would make sense. But if it's just real property that can be sold within 90 to, well, six months period for sure, uh, then uh, the trustees can have some explaining to do. Yeah, and I would agree with that. I mean, you know, you typically it has to be done within a reasonable time period. I think a year is a good, a good benchmark for most trusts. 
If it's more than a year, there should be a reason. If it's over two years, there better be a really good reason, you know. And we've seen cases where people come to us and it's been three and a half years and they haven't received a dime, and it's a relatively straightforward estate. So that kind of boggles the mind. The next question is, does trustee discretion mean they can hold my inheritance indefinitely? So uh, this is a kind of trust, Keith, where the the students, they pass away and they say, uh, I give you know my $3 million to my son, Johnny. However, that is subject to trustee discretion and it's absolute. The trustee has 100% discretion as to when to make any distribution of this $3 million to Johnny. Is that allowed? Uh, no. Well, I mean, it's allowed in the sense that a trustee can be given absolute discretion, as we call it, to make distributions to a beneficiary. What's not allowed is the trustee can't exercise that discretion unreasonably. And so that means that the trustee has to at least make an effort to reach out to the beneficiaries. Are there any needs? What's going on? Can I make a distribution? But if a trustee just says, I don't like you, Johnny, and I don't think you're living the life that I uh, think people should live because you don't go to church or you don't do this or that and so I'm not going to give you a dime that would be going too far even with absolute discretion there's really no such thing in, under California law as a trustee having unquestioned discretion the court can always question it the court can always overwrite it trustees have to act reasonably always has to be reasonable and everything a trustee does has to be reasonable and it has to benefit the beneficiary those are the two mandates so if a trustee that had absolute discretion over johnny's trust decided that they just wanted to be mean to johnny and make an, a distribution to johnny's ex-wife who he can't stand is that and, and she's not listed in the trust anywhere does that discretion allow the trustee to make a distribution to someone other than johnny it does not no i mean unless the trust terms allow a distribution to the ex-wife but if it doesn't no the trustee does not have the power to do that see the problem is i think is a lot of trustees especially lay people they they get a hold of these things and they say well i'm the trustee so i can do whatever i want i'm in charge as if they stepped into the shoes of the parent not true. Now the parent could do that because it was their money. The new successor trustee, once the parent passes away, cannot do that. They have to follow the directives of the trust and only the directives of the trust. They can't make up new terms. They can't make up new beneficiaries. They can't start. Another one is when they uh, a trustee gives money to charity. Yeah. And, and they're not listed as well, a beneficiary get, in the trust. Well, you got to get the charitable deduction. Come yeah. <laughs> right. But not if the trust said only names Johnny as the beneficiary. You can't just start giving money to charity. Right. It's it's not allowed. Right. Perhaps as a warning to uh, trustees or even to um, set lawyers, what are some of the what are some of the ways that um, we can try to avoid feeling like we have power over? the assets and the trust if we are a, a trustee. And what are some of maybe the, the warning signs or the, the things to look out for if you're a set war in determining uh, who your trustee is going to be or your estate? Ooh. That's a lot to ask. I mean, when it comes to selecting a trustee, I don't think people put enough time into it. And I think that professional trustees are a good resource and a good alternative to family member trustees or children trustees. And people just don't give it enough thought. Mm -hmm. As far as what a trustee can do, if you're taking over as a trustee, I would highly recommend that you get a consult with a trust attorney and be advised of what your duties and responsibilities are. There's just not enough trustees who do that, in my opinion. Um, what are your thoughts? Well, much of this comes down to personality. And yeah. so the set lawyers don't know exactly what the mix is going to be like. Maybe the set lawyers' best friend is the trustee. Right. And they get along great with the best friend. But the best friend may have a different outlook on life than the beneficiaries. And when the set lawyers pass away, the beneficiaries are going to push, probably upset the, tr the trustee from time to time. And then that's when these things go south right. or tend to go south. Right. So um, it's very difficult. I, I like what you're getting at, Manisha, is what can they do? But they need to pick their trustees wisely. And I, I wish there was a better formula for doing that, but they have to sit down and think about that. What's the relationship going to be like between the trustee and the kids? Uh, if it's just a blow through trust, chances are everyone's going to get along for a year. But it's when you get into these milestone payments or trustee discretion, that's where the kids tend to start getting upset at the trustee and vice versa. So for the, for the 
for the next question, Kayla, why don't we skip down to the last one there, because I think that's going to be a good follow-up to what we've just been talking about. Okay. Uh, my siblings want the trustee to continue to manage an apartment building, but I just want to be cashed out. Can I force a buyout? So you see this fairly often where you'll have a trustee who's managing these trust assets and for some reason in their mind they think that they're just going to keep on managing the trust assets indefinitely as if it were some sort of a corporation or partnership and they just assume that all the beneficiaries are going to toe the line and continue to be part owners of this thing I suppose and you'll have one or two or you know some portion of the beneficiaries who say I don't want to be a part of this just give me my money and let me get out of here and uh, let's assume that it's outright distribution, so the beneficiary should be getting their shares now. What what are they are they able to force a buyout in that situation, Stuart? Absolutely, uh, you're entitled to your distribution within a reasonable time period. And and I think the problem that you're describing is where a trustee has has come and lived with mom and dad for the last ten years while they're still living, taking over mom and dad's business of collecting rents and so forth. They're comfortable, they're happy, and they want to keep that going forward. Well, that's fine if all the beneficiaries agree, but if somebody says, no, I want my distribution, then they're gonna either have to take a loan against the property, really what they're gonna have to do is go to court and get that approved because it's a self-dealing issue, but you're, you're gonna have to take a loan against the property, pay that beneficiary out, and if the other beneficiaries wanna stick around, well, that's fine. But right now, if you're a beneficiary, you have a right to that uh, interest in the trust, and you have a right to a distribution, then you, you're not gonna be forced to be part of a family business going forward. You know, it's funny how often that happens. Though. It happens more often than you would think where a, a brother uh, trustee will decide that, well, I'm, I'm trustee. I get to just manage this forever. You know, I take over. I'm at, it's as if I took over the parent's position and now I just own this. So, yeah, it's definitely not allowed and you can force a buyout. Um, so that's all the time we have for today. I want to thank everyone for joining us on our Stamp Fight Win live stream. You can find a recorded version of this video on Facebook and our YouTube channel. And you can also find an audio only version on podbean.com. Thank you very much for joining us and look forward to seeing you again real soon. All right. Thank you. Thank you.